25 years ago tomorrow, a group of about 20 Ontarians with various disabilities gathered at Queen's Park with a mission. They wanted this province to pass a law committing future governments to making Ontario as barrier-free as possible so people with disabilities could achieve their full potential. 25 years later, how's that mission going? Let's find out from David Lepofsky, the chair of the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disability Act Alliance and a visiting professor at the Osgoode Hall Law School. And Thea Curdy is here. She's vice president at Designable Environments. And what did you just, what are you signing now, Thea? My name. That's your name? Yeah. In sign language. It okay, is. terrific. Uh, your first time on TV, so welcome. Very first time. Great to have you. And David, great to see you again. Always great to be here. I, I want you to start, David, because we need to just lay in place some of the history. Um, where did the notion of creating a movement to fight for a barrier-free Ontario, where'd that start from anyway? Well, it started from two points. Back in 1982, our Charter of Rights was enacted and our Human Rights Code in Ontario were amended to guarantee equality for people with disabilities. But a decade later, a number of us were coming to see that those rights were not becoming a reality in our lives. And the second thing was that in 1990, the U.S. Congress united Democrat and Republican alike to pass the groundbreaking Americans with Disabilities Act. And that movement uh, combined with the lack of success under the Charter of Rights and the Human Rights Code led a number of us to say, we need something new in Ontario to make for prog to create progress for, for people with disabilities. One of the new things that happened in Ontario, David, in 1990 was the election of the first ever deaf MPP named Gary Melkowski. How important do you think his election was to the overall cause? Well, it was really important because in the, in the dying days of the NDP provincial government under uh, then Premier Bob Ray, it was Gary Malkowski as a backbencher who, at our request, introduced the first uh, private member's bill uh, that would later be uh, converted into the legislation we got a decade later. Hmm. So he was important. He was important Absolutely. to the whole effort. Okay. Thea, let me bring you in here. 25 years later, when we design cities, when we make government policy, how much more attuned to disability issues do you think we are now relative to 25 years ago? Well, we certainly made progress from 25 years ago, but we're nowhere near where we could be and where we know we need to be. Why do you say that? Well, um, surprisingly, architects, urban planners, interior designers, landscape architects, none of these people are trained in accessibility. Um, our building code doesn't do what we know needs to be done. The AODA doesn't know, do what we need to know needs to be done. Um, we don't get the budget or the space to do it in the buildings that we're working on. And um, unfortunately, there's really no risk or penalty for not making it really accessible. It's interesting. You say that, that the people who are trained, presumably in the post-secondary sector, to design the cities and the buildings of the future, accessibility issues are nowhere in their training? Well, if it is in their training, um, because I do an accessibility boot camp, which is really fun. Okay. Um, and what I do in that boot camp is I teach people to see the barriers that we're surrounded with because they've been indoctrinated through their education that they only have to follow the OBC and the AODA. So they don't know Wait, about... We hate acronyms here, Thea. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so the Ontario Building Code okay. and the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act. Okay. So those are the only two pieces of legislation they're aware of, not understanding the hierarchy of the Ontario Human Rights Code, which says that uh, the built environment and spaces shall not discriminate against people. Hmm. So there's this sort of gap that we have between the minimums defined in our built uh, environment legislation and what the Human Rights Code's asking for. So people kind of have to guess in between, and in their education, they're only being taught the bare minimum. Hmm. David, let me get your view on that as well. How, how much more do you think city planners, architects, designers, are taking accessibility issues into account today compared to when you started out? Well, I can't measure how much progress there's been, but there's been way too little progress. Our public funds their training, and what our architect uh, schools and, and similar post-secondary programs for design professionals are doing is turning out new generations of unwitting barrier creators, because they keep designing new environments that are, are, are replete with accessibility problems. Not because they want to, but because whatever training they're getting, it's nowhere near what they need, nor are they aware of the risks that they're taking in terms of their own liability or for their clients when they fail to include accessibility in the design of the environments they design. 
we want to actually show an example right now that is not 15 minutes from this studio. Thea, this is the intersection of Jarvis Street and Charles Street in downtown Toronto. And again, for those who are listening on podcast and can't see us, and for our friend David here, who is visually impaired and cannot see the image that we have up on the screen right now, do you want to tell us what's going on in that picture? So this is an art installation on the southwest corner of the intersection that's in front of a convenience store. Um, there are uh, uh, long blue, blue metal bars that sort of resemble straws that look like they've all been sort of blown over towards the north, uh, putting many of them uh, at different angles and many at head height. So if you were walking along, maybe using your cell phone, not paying attention, or if you were blind, um, there is no way for you to have any warning before you smack your head on something like this. So, so this is very dangerous. David, this is, this is obviously an attempt to beautify the city. Somebody had the idea that this would be a, an attractive art installation to spruce up a downtown neighborhood. But presumably, they didn't take people like you into account when they did it. This happens to us, unfortunately, time and again. And your viewers are probably scratching their head going, how could somebody do that? But that's the risk that we folks with particularly those of us with vision disabilities, face every time we go out in our built environment, that there could be something sticking out at head level. At the law school where I teach, they did a major renovation of the Osgood Hall Law School, and in that major renovation, they installed angled pillars that similarly I was whacking my head on. Now, fortunately, it raised issues and they, uh, with this, and to their credit, the law school had this fixed, but the design professionals they engaged should never have let them do this in the first place, Place, much less have designed it for them to do this in the first place. This is presumably, though, David, a, an attempt to make something more visually pleasing or aesthetically pleasing to the eye, and they just don't take into account visually impaired people. How do you get that to change? Well, you get to that to change through two important measures that we've been calling for that Premier Ford referenced in a letter to us during the last election, and David Onley, our former lieutenant governor, also pointed to in an independent review uh, of our Disability Act that, he re that was released earlier this year. What is that? Number one, change the law. Pass regulations that specify what our built environment must include to be accessible and that where a designer uses those regulations and obeys them, the end result is truly accessible because our law falls flat on that and has for years. And the second thing is we need to require that before you get a license or keep a license to design our built environment, whether architects, landscape uh, designers, whoever, uh, that you need to have proper training in how to do accessible design. You can do accessible design that's also aesthetically wonderful design, mm -hmm. but if you don't know how to do accessible design, you inadvertently stumble into creating these barriers, and then we get whacked in the head. Well, Understood. I'm sorry, just to add to that, mm -hmm. I don't think people really understand that it really is discrimination. They don't think about it in that sort of term. So they don't think about the bias they have about what people with disabilities can or should do. Many people think that blind people shouldn't be going out by themselves or wouldn't be going out by themselves. So they don't see it with that sort of level of gravity. And I think that was one of the important things that Onley said in his report too, is yeah. that this really is discrimination. And until we sort of face up to good design is for everybody, and then the only other choice is to be discriminatory. See, the, the common belief out there, and it's pervasive, I've run into this many times, is that, well, our older buildings um, uh, lacked accessibility because, uh, you know, we didn't know better. I guess we hadn't invented people with disabilities 30 years ago. But, but now, now we know better and our laws are better and, uh, and uh, everything will be fine. But uh, the opposite's true. And uh, I've been at a session, uh, a consultation meeting on this when, when Thea's brought to the attention of the government the fact that, that we've experienced that sometimes newer buildings are worse than older buildings for accessibility. Everybody's trying to be fancier in their design. Yeah, and, 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 and by the way, the other thing that we found is that the barriers that hurt us hurt everybody. Mm -hmm. So the example of that uh, photograph you showed, the, the same um, piece of artwork that's sticking out that I could whack my head in will whack anybody in the head if they're looking at their phone uh, texting. Now, that's not to say that they can't exhibit that art in public, but it would be so easy to create a perimeter barrier around that so you simply can't walk uh, close enough to hit your head. So right. we're not saying you can't have that art out in public. You can, you can always reconcile aesthetics 
and achieve accessibility if you plan for it from the start. Thea, let's do another example here. And you brought this to my attention the other day. This is a small snippet of video that's been running on Twitter for a little while. Here, here's somebody pushing, I guess, the handicap symbol. Why don't you pick it up from here, Thea? Right, so there's a power door operator on the right-hand side with the international symbol of disability above it. And when the push person reaches out and pushes the button, it opens the door. But the door that opens, opens and shows us that it's leading to a set of stairs. Why in the world would you put a power door operator with a symbol that shows a person in a wheelchair along a path of travel that's clearly leading to a set of stairs that's not accessible? Hmm. So um, this is one of the problems with the international symbol of disability is that uh, you have to put it on to recognize the door as a power door operator. Um, but Disability is a whole lot more than wheelchairs, and I think that's one of the principal things that's failing us, uh, is that most of our regulations are really only looking at wheelchairs. They're not thinking about people who are blind or deaf, autistic, have multiple chemical sensitivities, have dementia, arthritis, the list goes on. And because of that, here's an accommodation that was probably put in there, you know, my best guess is that door is heavy. Mm -hmm. So they're assisting with opening the door that's heavy, but the conflict is that because the symbol is a person in a wheelchair, and it doesn't help people in wheelchairs. David, let me get your take on, th there, is, there are literally billions of dollars worth of public transit upgrades that are happening in the capital city of Ontario right now. Starting with an LRT that is going in not 100 meters north of this television station, the Eglinton Crosstown. Um, you know, there are new subway stations coming. It's, it's, it's really gonna be quite magnificent. Do you have any undertaking or understanding from authorities that they are aware that when they build all these new subway lines and LRT lines and so on, that they have to be taking disability issues into account. Oh, they all say the right thing. And then they build uh, new uh, infrastructure, new subway stations, or new other, pub uh, other public transit uh, that are replete with accessibility barriers. Um, last year, we released a, a video. You can look up AODA Alliance and public transit on YouTube, and you'll see that thousands of people have seen a video that we uh, released uh, that documents that the new subway stations going up at, to York University and beyond, built with our money, with federal and provincial taxpayers' money, are replete with accessibility bungles. Give us an example. Well, I'll give you an example. You go to York University, where, where I, I teach part-time. Uh, there's a nice tactile walking path to cane detectable on the subway platform to help safely guide me along the subway platform it walks me right into a pillar. Like it <laughs> guides me into a pillar. I'll give you another example. Uh, that subway station has two exits. Only one of them has an elevator. The other one has an elevator shaft roughed in, but they never put in an elevator. If the one elevator that's there fails, and that often unpredictably can happen on TTC, hmm. that means it becomes a completely inaccessible subway station. And these are just, the, sadly, typical things that go on. We've asked government after government, including the current government of Doug Ford, including the federal government of Justin Trudeau, to require that no one may use our public money to build any infrastructure unless they ensure that it is accessible, that you should never use public money to uh, create new barriers against people with disabilities. And sadly, neither level of government has agreed. I wonder if part of this is that they think that people with disabilities are a relatively small and insignificant part of the population, and therefore, why bother? Do you want to put that to rest, David? Well. If you listen to the rhetoric from both levels of government, from the Minister for Accessibility federally, Carla Qualtro, and from the Minister for Accessibility provincially, Raymond Cho, both of them recognize the opposite. There's over two million Ontarians now have a disability, over six million Canadians now have a disability, but everybody watching this show either has a disability now or sometime between the now, now and the, uh, the end of your life, will get a disability. We're all bound to if you don't have one now. I, I used to be a sighted person. I'm now totally blind. It happens over time. I had partial vision before, but I'm, uh, as you get older, you acquire disabilities. It's only natural. So that these barriers are not hurting a minority or a tiny minority. They're actually hurting the minority of everybody. And I can't imagine how a politician in the year 2019 can succeed if they systematically ignore the needs of the minority of everybody. 
Thea, you are doing something with the Royal Architectural Institute of Canada. What is it? Yeah, this is a really cool um, opportunity. I went and did the boot camp for their um, conference, and so many of the participants, the architects, were just so outraged to discover we didn't learn any of this. That uh, this summer we were contacted again and asked, would you like to help us put together the first post-secondary uh, credit course um, for architects around accessibility? Now, a few weeks ago, I just did a presentation at the A11Y IRL conference, the In Real Life conference. Right. Uh, A11Y stands for accessibility. Um, and I was talking about the importance of transforming education. Because what hasn't changed? We've changed our laws. But every time we've changed our laws, our education hasn't changed. Um, so at the conference, I was talking about accessibility really to really be holistic and understand that people face a lifetime of changing needs and ability. Um, that we really have to integrate accessibility into every aspect of our course. Who are we designing for? To David's point about this idea that we're all an illness, accident, or aging away from getting a disability, uh, means that our courses have to really be fundamentally changed from the ground up. And I would love to see that kind of investment, retrain the trainers, rework the courses so that our graduates don't keep making these same mistakes. Mm. But this course is the first course that we're getting a chance to do. And they're letting me do whatever I want with it. You're so having at them. I'm having at them. We're covering ableism. We're covering bias. We're, we're teaching them to see barriers. And then we're doing both the practical and the theoretical. So with any luck, the people who graduate or who take this course, they're going to be a lot smarter in the way they design our cities in the future. So it's really a step one. Mm -hmm. It's going to sort of open them up to realize there's a lot more to learn. Steve, we're, we're asking the provincial government to take two steps. And they're both steps which... Uh, which uh, Doug Ford identified when he wrote us of what he was prepared to do during the, the last provincial election. They're both steps which the David Onley Independent Review has recommended. And Premier Ford's own accessibility minister, Raymond Cho, said that Onley did a marvelous job in this report. And those two steps are to first upgrade our legislation so that it does require accessibility in, uh, in buildings. And buildings are not the only accessibility issue. I want to make that clear. There are lots of other barriers we face, but that's one that we're chatting about just now. Uh, but also that requires uh, design professionals to be trained in this area. Now, sadly, last May, um, an opposition uh, motion calling for the government to do just that was defeated by the government and was condemned by the government as just red tape. And our rights are not red tape. So we, what we're doing is we're reaching out to Premier Ford. We'd like to meet with him. We'd like to sit down with him and to talk about the leadership that we need him to show to get his government to, to start taking act, positive action on this uh, issue. Because for the first year and a half in office, we've sadly had to give them a failing F grade on accessibility. They're going even slower than the previous Kathleen Wynne government, and that's not easy <laughs> to do, I regret. I have uh, 15 seconds left to do uh, two things. One is to thank you both for coming in tonight. The second is to um, marvel at the pins that you are wearing here. David Lepofsky's got his Order of Canada, his Order of Ontario. And Thea, you've got a pin on that I don't think I've seen in this studio before. Do you want to share it with us? Sure. Look at that. You're a big Star Trek fan, aren't you? I am. You? Does that communicator work? No, it doesn't. I was going to say, you can beam us out of here right now if you want to. I'd love to. David Lepofsky and Thea Curdy, thanks so much for coming into TVO tonight. Thank you so much, Ryan. Thank you so much. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.